The title of my sermon is Sinners Can Come to the Feast. Sinners Can Be Cleansed. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to be walking through the passage together as we go through this this sermon together, Matthew chapter 22, Matthew chapter 22. Sinners can be cleansed. Terrible sinners like me can actually be made whole. My life is built on this premise. We never, ever mature past the need to be transformed by the renewal of the gospel. Some of the worst abuses of Christianity happen when we start with the gospel, but somehow are deceived into thinking that maintenance of the Christian life is just mere knowledge acquisition. Climbing the ladder of corporate success and the Christian community by reputation and not genuine growth in continual transforming grace. I want to highlight verses 9 and 10, actually, just to start. Matthew 22, 9 and 10. Go, therefore, to the main highways, and as many as you find there, invite to the wedding feast. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered together all they found, both evil and good. And the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. As something of an introduction to the sermon, let me tell you a story. A story about June. There was a woman named June. She was a graduate of an Ivy League university living and working in Manhattan. She became so obsessed with her physical image that she developed eating disorders and substance addictions. She came to see that she was heading for self-destruction, but she also realized that she had no particular reason to stop being reckless with her life. After all, what did her life even mean? Why not be self-destructive? She turned to church and sought an understanding of God's mercy and an experience of his reality. She saw a counselor at the church who helped her draw a connection between the mercy of God and her seemingly inexhaustible need for acceptance. Finally, she had the confidence to seek an encounter with God himself. Though she can't pinpoint one moment, she came to feel, she said, for the first time, unconditionally loved as a true daughter of God. Gradually, she received freedom from her self-destructive behavior. Or Jeffrey, another great story. An amazing musician, raised in a conservative Jewish home. Both his father and mother suffered terribly with cancer, his mother succumbing to it. Because of a variety of physical ailments from his youth, he took up the practice of Chinese healing arts along with Taoist and Buddhist meditation, and became extremely focused on physical wellness. He was in no state of spiritual need when a friend began taking him to church. He liked the sermons up until that Jesus business came around at the end, at which point he'd stop listening. Soon, however, he became jealous of his Christian friend's joy and hope for the future that he had not encountered before. Then he began listening to the ends of the sermons and realizing they posed an intellectual challenge that he had not wanted to face. Finally, to his surprise, during his times of meditation, he discovered 
his moments of normally pure quiet and stillness were constantly interrupted by visions of Jesus on the cross. He began to pray to the Christian God, and soon he realized that his dominant life narrative had been the escape and total avoidance of suffering. Makes sense, right? Especially given his story, his childhood. Now he saw how futile such a life was. When he understood that Jesus had surrendered his physical health and life to save the world and him, it moved him deeply. He saw a way to get the courage to face the inevitable suffering of the future and to know there would be a path through it. He embraced the gospel of Jesus Christ. Sinners can change, even you. Let's look at chapter 22 and start with verse one. Read along with me or listen carefully. Jesus spoke to them again in parables saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And he sent out his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast and they were unwilling to come. Again, he sent out other slaves saying, tell those who have been invited, behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fattened livestock are all butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went their way. One to his own farm, another to his business. Pause right there. In cultures where Christianity is maybe strong and the culture is affluent and prosperous, this is the temptation. This is the pattern. We think too little of God, too little of the church, too little of what we have. And our distractions, our, our entertainments, and our affluence, this is a very real threat. Verse 6, and the rest seized his slaves and mistreated them and killed them. But the king was enraged, and he sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and set their city on fire. Then he said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Once upon a time, there was a people. God loved them. He elected them. Turn with me to Ezekiel 16. Ezekiel 16, verse 3. Thus says the Lord God to Jerusalem, your origin and your birth are from the land of the Canaanite. Your father was an Amorite and your mother a Hittite. As for your birth on the day you were born, your navel cord was not cut, nor were you washed with water for cleansing. You were not rubbed with salt or even wrapped in clothes. Cloths. Verse six, when I passed by you and saw you squirming in your blood, I said to you while you were in your blood, live. Yes, I said to you while you were in your blood, live. Look at verse nine. I bathed you with water, washed off your blood from you and anointed you with oil. I also clothed you with embroidered cloth and put sandals of porpoise skin on your feet. That's interesting. Dolphin sandals. And I wrapped you with fine linen and covered you with silk. Look at these things. I adorned you with ornaments, put bracelets on your hands and a necklace around your neck. I also put a ring in your nostril, earrings in your ears, and a beautiful crown on your head. Thus you were adorned with gold and silver, and your dress was of fine linen, silk and embroidered cloth. You ate fine flour, honey, and oil. So you were exceedingly beautiful and advanced to royalty. Then your fame went forth among the nations on account of your beauty, for it was perfect because of my splendor, which I bestowed on you, declares the Lord God. But you trusted in your beauty and played the harlot because of your fame. And you poured out your harlotries, harlotries on every passerby who might be willing. 
And so Israel's stubborn and recalcitrant past is evidenced just in that passage alone. They forgot God. In so many generations of Israel, any particular generation will do. They knew God who witnessed his salvation, who had known and seen with their very eyes answered prayer time and time again. They did not teach their children to fear God. So the children forgot and did not know God. And yet God continued to pursue them. The theme of the parable is the pay, the theme of this parable. And we'll work through the entire parable is the patience of Yahweh for his people. The Old Testament church. Look at one other passage in the Old Testament with me to illustrate the, the depth of what is happening in context. In order for us to best understand this parable today, we have to go back to Judea. We have to go back to the time. Deuteronomy 7, 6 and following. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any of the peoples. For you were the fewest of all peoples. But because the Lord loved you and kept the oath which he swore to your forefathers, the Lord brought you out by a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Moses, Elijah, Isaiah, which they murdered. Jeremiah, whom they treated despicably. God was all these, all this grace, all this pursuit, all these reminders over generations to keep his covenant love on his people. One is reminded of the parable of the, the landowner, if you remember that, or some call it the parable of the wicked tenants. This is the story of Israel. And so, the, the parallel, you should look at it, the parallel between verses 1 through 3 of Matthew 22, um, look at chapter 21, verses 33 through 35, just above. Jesus is telling stories, and it's all about Israel. This is Israel's history. He's telling them their history. This is what you have done. This is God, and this is you. This is the pattern. And so 21, 33 through 35 parallel verses one through three and 36 through 41 of Matthew 21 parallels with four through eight that we have just read. This parable, let's continue to situate it. Jesus is in the final stages of his life right now, Matthew 22. He finally entered Jerusalem on what we call Palm Sunday. He cleansed the temple. His authority was being hotly challenged. And he began telling stories. Interestingly, stories of his people. The parable of the fig tree, which is Israel. The parable of the two sons and their father's command to work and bring in the fruit that he calls for, and so on. Jeremiah 7, 4 through 11, I came across as highly illuminating in light of the temple cleansing that Jesus had just done. I do want to look at that for a moment. Whenever Jesus does things in his ministry, whenever he quotes scripture, a verse or two, looking back at the context is highly illuminating for understanding the force of what he was actually doing. Jesus always quotes from the context. In Jeremiah 7, listen to this. Do not trust, Jeremiah said, in deceptive words, saying, this is the temple of the Lord the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. We're reformed. Justification by faith. For if you truly amend your ways and your deeds, if you truly practice justice, Jeremiah said, between a man and his neighbor, if you do not oppress the alien, the orphan or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, nor walk after other gods to your own ruin, then I will let you dwell in this place in the land that I gave to your forefathers forever and ever. Behold, you are trusting in deceptive words to no avail. Will you steal, murder, 
commit adultery and swear falsely and offer sacrifices to Baal and walk after other gods that you have not known? Then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, we are delivered that you may do all these abominations. And here's the, it's picked up in the temple cleansing. Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your sight? Behold, I, even I, have seen it, declares the Lord. So when God visits his people, he wants to know, how are you treating each other? Is it genuine? How are you treating my people, your neighbors? So Jesus takes account of these things. Listen, using religion as a cloak for wickedness has long since been a plague among the initiated, the educated, those who know better. Israel flocked to their theology as a covering for their disobedience. The temple, their ancestry. What about, what about the church? What about us? Do we flock to good things as a cover for inward toxicity? A Christian's liturgy may be flawless, but their hearts septic. Because worship, divorced from personal obedience, oft Israel's problem is an abomination. And so this is the state of Israel actually before Babylon's destruction. This is what Jeremiah was warning of. Again, it happened the state of Israel before Rome's destruction of the Jewish nation and the temple in 70 AD. And so the context of this parable is political strife, terrorism, conflict in society. When Jesus was a youth, a man named Judas the Galilean led a tax revolt against Rome. This is not that long before Jesus came on the scene. Jude the sledgehammer, they called him. And he would get hammered, all right, hammered to a Roman cross after his insurrection. He persuaded many Jews that they should not pay the tax to those bloody Romans, and he led an armed revolt, but was in turn bloodily suppressed by the Romans. This is the world that Jesus was born into. Revolution was in the air. But it was not a good revolution. A note on that. When men want revolution, it is usually a desire for the wealth and power that the people at the top have. But the people who are discontent know that they can't get leverage for their cause by stating that as their reason. So the revolution has to be couched in terms of their suppression for the cause of justice, equality, human rights, etc. And so right after this parable that we're in review today, Jesus addresses the poll tax to Caesar. The big issue for the Jews at this time was how to deal with the Romans, the use of the law, and eschatology. That is, how are we going to bring in the kingdom and have God on our side in the process? So many people throughout history have wanted to grab a portion of Jesus for their interests. Early in Jesus's ministry, some of the Pharisees were attracted to Jesus because of the power he possessed. The common people in society tended to love Jesus, right? He went out among them. He didn't separate himself. When the unclean pressed in on him, he didn't recoil. He healed them. He didn't speak like the chief priests. He told stories. He spoke with authority. And he threw down against those who abused their power and were hypocritical. And they loved that. And yet, he didn't quite fit their sensibilities either. He wasn't going to rise up like all the other hot-headed zealots of his time and slaughter the Romans. That's what the poor and powerless wanted. Jesus' program was death and resurrection. And for his followers too. 
and their resurrection would come later. Jesus does not conform to our categories. We must conform to his, including in this parable. The story continues past the judgment of the murderers in verse seven. So look at verse seven and picture Jesus alluding to the story of Israel before Babylon. But the king was enraged and he sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and set their city on fire. You see, most fitting to see this as an allusion to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, used in God's judgment to destroy the temple in 586 BC. But it goes on from there. God's patience, his forbearance, his pursuit of the party of his grace continues. So the king's joy in this parable, the king's joy that his son shall have a good wedding <laughs> and for his followers too. His will cannot be thwarted or foiled. The only question is, is if we will be there. That's his message. Then he said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. So the apostles are sent out to Galilee of the Gentiles, to the Jews that the other Jews did not like and did not want to be at the party. A lot of issues in life can be clarified when we trace the root of relational problems to the fact that we just plain old simply don't like them. True of then, true of today. When we don't like someone, we need to be very, very careful how we treat them. Our words, our actions, they bleed through. They bleed through. We need to be more honest. If, I'm, if you will allow me to apply something very particularly in the middle of this parable. Who is invited to the party? That's kind of the theme and the working in this parable. Let's look at nine and 10. So the king says, go therefore to the main highways and as many as you find there invite to the wedding feast. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered together all they found, both evil and good. And the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. Let's remember that Christianity is an invitation to a grace feast. That messed up, wicked Christian people can truly be forgiven. Not just at the beginning of the Christian experience, but it is a continual need for us. One commentator says this, God, the king, the host of the grand feast yet to come, is not looking around seeking whom he may condemn because of his son by virtue of his death and resurrection is drawing all to creation to himself, to the pivotal event of all human history, the marriage supper of the lamb. God wills above all to celebrate. And because when God is happy, everybody, dadgummit, should be happy. <laughs> a gracious invitation to join him in his joy. Salvation is not by works. And the heavenly banquet is not an option. We can't maintain the Christian life by our works. Notice the theme of undeserved grace in this parable. If our motivation is our reputation in the Christian life, we're becoming a Pharisee. If we obey God to actually get him to do something for us, build up those expectations in our heart like that paycheck, we're drinking Pharisee juice. What is our state? How do we see ourselves as characters in this parable? In every age, in every generation, it is our duty 
to ensure we have not become hypocritical, graceless, merciless, and cruel, hard-hearted Pharisees. Pharisaism. This is the temptation of the doctrinally correct, the temptation of the conservative ethos. It's to lose the weightier matters of the law, justice, loving mercy itself, and faith, our first love. We know that the gospel of pure 100% proof grace is supposed to be our identity. But if ever so subtly, our identity self-worth becomes based mainly on how hard we work, successful, or even how moral we are, we will begin to look down on those we perceive as lazy or immoral. Because we're evaluating on performance through self alone, which is what the world does. When we are criticized or our children are in rebellion, we might become furious or devastated, blaming everything and everyone, because it is critical that we be considered mature, put together, examples to all. We are turning into a Pharisee. If it is critical to our identity that we be perceived in the community as a good, mature person. These are the traps. These are the things that turn people's hearts in a different direction. One theologian says, identity apart from God is inherently unstable. And this is the case even with good things, if it's not identity derived from Christ. And so the truth is, how we think about ourselves really matters in Christ or in something else. Listen, most of the Pharisees did not come to the feast that was Christ for reasons like this and more. If our security and worth, our significance and value are in essentially anything else but the sheer grace of God, we are either becoming apostate or else a Pharisee, or even both. Why is this the case for this person I'm illustrating? Because this version of Christianity, by the time it travels from the head to the heart, is only a false version of the real thing. To use another expression, it's only skin deep. It's shallow. Let's finish the parable. Verses 11 through 14. But when the king came in to look over the dinner guests, he saw a man there who was not dressed in wedding clothes. And he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. Then the king said to his servants, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. It might seem harsh. Here's a magnanimous king in this parable who invites everyone to the wedding banquet. But when he finds a person without wedding clothes, identifies him. And after giving him a chance to explain himself and he's found out, it's a way with him. What's going on here? Well. We can't respond to the invitation outwardly without submitting to the king inwardly. It's a part of what's happening. Look here now. These last set of verses are not some angry preacher. A hateful theologian with anger issues. These are those red letter words of Jesus. Jesus does not conform to us. We conform to him and his word. He's good. He knows what he's doing with the world, with us. 
He's the boss. We can trust him. And yes, there is judgment here. God is not a marshmallow in the sky. A precious moment's figurine in a china closet. A Thomas Kincaid painting. (laughs) He is the creator of the sun, of Jupiter. He controls the affairs of the cosmos, of all of history, and he knows how to divide between the joints and the marrow, the soul and the spirit, the heart of man. There are hard edges in God's kingdom and in God's eternity. We have to be clothed in the wedding garments of the righteousness of Christ on you, or you will be found out. In context, Israel must recognize her Messiah and repent so that healing may come. That's the point. It's Jesus or death. You have to go through the door. Remember his words elsewhere in the Gospels. The only door is Christ. He said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. So Jesus ends with hell. He would not be a God of love if he didn't clearly warn that people cannot rebel forever. You have to have his wedding garment. One writer says this, if they will not accept his vindication, God takes no delight in their perishing but ultimately it is no skin off his nose. He will rub them, still vindicated, off his list of fun people and go hunt for others who can recognize a good time when they hear it. The ticket, just come to the end of yourself. Stop fighting God. Stop striving. Go all in. Give everything up. No, you can't wear your own clothes. Stop asking. Only his. You must be baptized. Baptized by his spirit. And the one and only one commanded symbol for that reality is baptism in the triune name. It's not superstition. It's not magic water. It's a living thing a healthy, real, growing, active profession your whole life. And again and again and again, God is patient. God is gracious, calls his stubborn people to himself, even though they rebel, even though they're not thankful, even us. Remember that the angels rejoice when one sinner is reborn. Christ. I like this theologian's comments. He says, he, God, doesn't care a fig that we look like pigs and smell worse. Oh, you smell good like perfume, you say. Think again. God smells all your inner things, your thoughts, wishing that certain people would die. Calculated, excuse me, Calculated meanness, pride, ugliness of spirit, selfishness, the whole lot. But God so loves the world. That's a good promise, right? For God so loves the world. He doesn't care that they don't know hors d'oeuvres from Havana cigars. He doesn't care that they eat with their hands and blow their noses without handkerchiefs. In other words, he does not make qualifications and stipulations about any of these or anything like it in this parable. They do not have to get their act together in order to be worthy of the party. Any more than the prodigal son had to guarantee amendment of life before getting the fatted calf. They have only, like the prodigal, to accept the acceptance. Stop fussing, darn it. Shut up. Get off of yourself. Go with the flow. 
sinners can be cleansed. The king and the father, you see, are party people. They will take only yes for an answer. Can I ask you, do you understand grace? I mean, do you actually understand the gospel? Of all the things that we could describe Christianity as in its content, do you understand the gospel? Are you willing to be least lost? Here's something. Are you willing to be weak? I think we despise being weak, especially for those of us who end up taking too much pride in our strength, that it becomes actually too important to our sense of happiness. To be a servant. The test of willingness to have the humility to be a servant is when people treat you like a servant as not important, little respect. Are you willing to go deep in grace by suffering, sickness, failure, inadequacy, to become poor, literally, if that's what it takes for God to teach you the gospel, to teach you grace? I fear for many Americans, nine. Absolutely not, not willing. And so their hearts become hard and closed off to what God is trying to teach them life is all about, which is his program. Lostness, littleness, leastness, death. There's no other way to come to grace, my friends, but through death, death to self. And so God's call is out everywhere in this parable, to the feast, both the evil and the good. These terms aren't absolute categories. There will be genuine good at the end, sheep and genuinely bad goats. And Jesus is speaking to those race and rank boundaries in his context for who the evil and the good were. The wedding feast was going to be filled with all the wrong people in society. And so Jesus and the apostles upset all the categories of that codified first century world. His spirit still upsets the categories that power grabbing men still create in every age. His spirit upset the deeply religiously entrenched Roman Catholic church in the 16th century. Flannery O'Connor with her pen as sharp as a scalpel in the 1950s and 60s sought to disturb the Christian elitist Pharisee, wherever they may be found, Roman Catholic, Greek Orthodox, Lutheran, or Calvinist. Flannery goes after Jesus style, those self-righteous, ruthlessly critical and condemning of other people, spiritually blind bats of society through her stories of subversion. And so, regardless of our profession, if, you, if we refuse to come before God transparent and raw and instead come to him with relentless self-justification, we need to beware. If we feel that we have to clean ourselves up before God will accept us, you're not understanding grace. If you feel that you can never be transparent and raw in weakness before your community, a mess, and that you don't really need profound mercy, just stop. We need to be real. Come to the feast. Look not on that which lies behind, but open your heart to grace because Jesus is the friend of sinners. Jesus is the friend of sinners only. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.